all for your prayers. Wonderful job that you did, church. We felt the power of prayer wherever we went. Uh, Randy and I were down in the southern area and Wallisso, and we were teaching at the college down there doing an exposition of Romans and getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. That was a wonderful time. And then the rest of the team was up north, and they did a great job at the clinic in Atalu. And uh, we saw a lot of people come to know Christ. And so if you want to report with some pictures just right after this over in the ministry, uh, the chapel in Dr. Frankel's class, we're going to be sharing. And that includes my uh, Sunday school class as well. We'll be meeting over there. And we just love to share you. The Ethiopian people said this. They said, please, please go home and tell your church thank you. Thank you for not forgetting us. Thank you for remembering us. Thank you for praying for us. And thank you for sending a team. You don't know what a blessing First Baptist Church is to them. And I want to let you know and convey that on their behalf, how much they really do love you. So with your Bible open to Exodus chapter 14, we're going to look at our passage of Scripture. But let's get caught up in our story here. As you know, this is the exodus. The children of Israel are leaving Egypt, and there is some million to two million of them. They're going to be departing Egypt, and they're going to be going to the promised land. But as you notice, according to the map, they're going to take the long route. In fact, they're going to be 40 years in the desert because God is going to be teaching them some things. You would think that they would get out of Egypt and make a hard left turn and go along the coast, but no, they make a right turn according to the direction that God gives them because they need to get Egypt out of them. They've been slaves for 430 years. They still think, they still act, they still believe, and they still act like slaves. Well, they have left Egypt. They have parted. Pharaoh in his frustration has said, get out of here, go. After the ten plagues that had come upon them, they realized the power of God. And the last plague, the most powerful one, were the firstborn in every family that did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost was put to death. That was it. And that included the prince of Egypt, Pharaoh's own child. What a hard thing to go through. But that's exactly what happened. Well, as they're on their way, as they're leaving, as they're headed out the door and on the path, Pharaoh begins to think to himself, you know what, I'm not sure this is a good idea letting them go. I miss my slave labor. I miss the workers. I miss ordering them around. I want them back. And the text says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and he decided to grab his chariots and his horsemen and he is going to go after the children of Israel. And if they're not going to return back and be a slave, then I'm going to put every single one of them to death. And so he begins his mad pursuit from them. And if you look at the map carefully, you will note that the Red Sea is in front of them. God has put them in a strategic place where if they turn back, they're going to go right into Pharaoh's army. And the only place to go is to move forward. But they can't because there's this massive body of water called the Red Sea in front of them. And beginning in verse 10, we pick up the story. Look at it with me. Verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, it is because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you while we were in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again. And the Lord will fight for you, and you will have only to be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? 
Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. That the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God, who is going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud and the darkness and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down upon the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee. Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come up back upon them, upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course. When the morning appeared, and as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all of the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. And the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw that the Egyptians, or the Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. What a story. Amen to that, huh? This is one of the climactic points in the book of Exodus. Alex Montoyer, a incredible Old Testament scholar, says that there is probably more references in our Old Testament to the crossing of the Red Sea than we can count. There are numerous occasions in the Old Testament and in the New Testament where we discover over and over again a repeat of what God has done. If you read the Psalms, Psalm 78, he divided the sea and let them pass through it. And he made the waters stand like a heap. Psalm 106 speaks so clearly of his mighty power and how he rebuked the Red Sea. And the land became dry and they passed through it. And what's beautiful about it when it's referencing the land, the, the ground that they walk on, that said is it was as a desert. That's how dry it was. But not just there. You have Deuteronomy. You have Isaiah. You have multiple, multiple places throughout your Old Testament and even in your New Testament that tell us and reference this story because it is the climactic story of salvation for the children of Israel. 
And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what is this all about? What is this incredible story of crossing the Red Sea all about? If you go on the internet and you Google the meaning of the Red Sea, you're going to find all kinds of interpretations. One that I found, a popular preacher simply said, this story symbolizes the obstacles that stand in the way of our dreams. And the Lord wants us to know that our dreams are big. And he wants you to dream big. And any obstacle that is in the way of you dreaming big, you just need to trust the Lord. Because he will remove the obstacle of whatever your big dream is. And that's what this story is about. I about puked when I read that. Because... (laughs) This is not about what your dreams are and the obstacles that are in the way of your dreams. This story is a powerful story about the salvation of the Lord and what he did for his glory. I remind you that God does all things for his glory. That the story of this book is about his glory and how we as his people can be molded and shaped for the glory of God. God does have a dream for you, and that is to reflect the image of His Son Christ in all that we do. We are to give great glory to God. We are His church. We are His people. He created us. He made us. He redeemed us. Let us fulfill our destiny and give glory to God in everything that we do. Perhaps the New Testament has something to say about this, and oh yes, my brothers and sisters, it does. In fact, let me turn you to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, particularly the Transfiguration, chapter 9, and let me show you what the New Testament thinks about what happened. And I'm going to suggest this, that if the Bible interprets the Bible, if the New Testament interprets the Old Testament, that you ought to take the understanding of the New Testament and its interpretation over anything that you might suppose it to mean. Because this is God's Word, infallible, inerrant, and inspired. Here's what the Lord says. Now it was eight days after these things, Jesus, that is, took with him Peter and John and James, and they went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. This is is the transfiguration where Jesus unveils himself to these four disciples and shows himself and begins to show them his glory and behold notice this verse 32 men were talking with him Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem now what is going on here what is this departure that he is talking about well what is interesting is that Luke gives us a clear understanding of something that he was going to accomplish that had not yet been done, but that was going to be done in Jerusalem. And if you've read your Bible and you understand it, it is the death, it is the resurrection, it is the ascension, and it is the departure of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. It is all about him securing our salvation it is about him and his act of salvation and so this departure that he is speaking of is something that the old testament had been longing for and waiting for it is the fulfillment of the salvation of the lord and it's interesting because this word departure luke tells us very clear in the greek text is the word Exodus. Think about that. He appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus. In other words, Jesus is going to accomplish the ultimate exodus. He is not just going to symbolically liberate his people from slavery, but Jesus is going to lead a great escape. He is going to lead the escape out of the wilderness of sin and the darkness of Egypt. And he is going to lead his people into the promised land. We, by the Lord Jesus Christ, have been bought and purchased by him. 
And the New Testament sees the Exodus as the ultimate fulfillment of what was prefigured in Moses delivering the people through the hand and the work of God. Hebrews puts it this way. By faith, he left Egypt. That's referring to Moses. Not being afraid of the anger of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Notice this, verse 28. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn may not touch them. It was an escape, leaving the bondage of sin, leaving the world of Egypt, parallels our Lord redeeming us from sin and leading us to the promised land. In fact, if you look even further in the book of Corinthians, listen to what Paul says. It may sound a little bit confusing, but listen for just a moment. You'll understand the analogy. Verse 10, chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Actually, that's verse 1. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed, notice, through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So what we have here is a clear interpretation of what the Exodus is all about. What Moses did in leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, crossing the sea into the wilderness on their way to the promised land, is what the greater Moses, Jesus, did for his people. If you could talk to the average Israelite and say, I noticed you're in the wilderness. Who are you? What happened to you? Where do you come from? They would say, well, I was in a foreign land. I was under the sentence of death. I was in bondage. But I took shelter under the blood of the lamb. We put the lamb's blood on the doorpost and on the lintel. And our mediator took us out and we crossed over and we're now on our way to the promised land. We're not there yet, but he has given us his law. He's given us a community. He has given us a tabernacle, and he is there in the presence, and we live by his grace and his forgiveness. That's the same thing you and I say, that we were in bondage to sin. We were in bondage to Satan. We were in bondage to evil. But our mediator, who was Christ Jesus, a greater mediator, came and liberated. And we're now on our way, free from sin, onto the promised land. And he is going to lead us there. And when this life is all over, and our life is done and complete, and they bury us or we get raptured away, we will stand in his glory in paradise with him and a place that he has made for us because Jesus Gave us the great escape. Amen, church? And I want to just talk about three things quickly this morning. First of all, I want you to learn what you're escaping from. That's the first thing. The second thing I want you to learn is how we escape. And the third thing I want you to understand is why we can escape. You see, we escape from bondage of sin. Just like they were in bondage to slavery, we were in bondage to sin. That's what the word redemption means in your New Testament. We have been redeemed. Just as Pharaoh had the children of Israel enslaved and was using them for his own purposes, so you and I were enslaved to sin. But through the powerful work and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has redeemed us. That word luro means to loose. He's released us from the bondage of sin. But here's what's interesting. This bondage has multiple layers. It, it, it has multiple layers that we need to understand. Uh, the very first layer of our bondage is Objectively, we find ourselves under the law of God. 
we find ourselves failing to meet his standards. And the standard is perfection. In fact, God very clearly in the book of Romans tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's every single one of us. We're under the weight of sin. We're under the weight of God's condemnation upon us. We are under his wrath. He has a judicial opposition to evil and to sin. And because we are sinners, we're under God's judgment. But Jesus Christ, through his power and through his salvation and through his death on the cross, liberates us from sin. And now Paul emphasizes, beginning in Romans chapter 8, that we are now, therefore, under no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been liberated from that condemnation. He has freed us from the bondage of sin. But you see, just as the children of Israel were liberated from Egypt, they're already on their journey, they're already on their way, they come up to the sea, they're getting ready as they're all strategically placed there by God, they've actually left Egypt, what happens? Pharaoh decides, I want them back. I'm not going to let them go. I'm going to go after them. You see, here's what happens to us in our life. Even though we are saved and even though we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and we have come to him in faith, sin still desires to enslave us. Even though there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, we have a problem. And the problem is, is subjectively, we can't get this through our mind that we are free in Christ. And so Satan continually wants to remind us and he wants to entrap us. In fact, not only does he do this through temptation, he does this because we are still in our earthly bodies, this flesh. This flesh that I have is not yet fully redeemed. And I know that as a person who trusts and believes in Jesus Christ, I know that I still sin. And so what happens to me is even though I know that I still sin, I can't seem to get through my mind that by simply repenting and confessing, my relationship with God is restored and my sins are forgiven past, present, and future. And I don't say that so that I can live in sin. I say that so I don't live in slavery to my sin. And I've met people over and over again who I know who are redeemed, who I know who are saved, yet they're still battling their flesh. I meet people when I go to the hospital and I'm praying with them. They think they're going to die. And they say, oh, pastor, I'm so glad you're here. Pray with me. And I know they're a believer. I know they've given their life to Christ. And yet they'll say things like, oh, pastor, I, I must not be saved. I, I, I wasn't a very good dad. Oh, pastor, I, I, I didn't raise my kids like I should have. And they begin to go through a whole litany, confessing all of their sins, as if they think that reconfessing all of their sins is somehow going to make them redeemed. And I need to remind them, yes, it's good to confess your sins and God will forgive you. But please understand, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you are redeemed and that cannot be taken away from you. And for some of you, you need to get the monkey off your back that keeps dragging you back into slavery. You need to stop listening to what the evil one says who continually says, oh, look what you've done. Look at how you live. Look at what you're thinking. Oh, you can't be a Christian. I know what you just did. I heard you the other day when you were you hammering that nail and it slipped, the hammer slipped and it hit your thumb and you let out that curse word. How dare you? dare you curse like that? You can't be a Christian. That's what Satan says. And you keep feeding that junk in your mind all the time, continually, 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 and you've got to get that monkey off your back. And you get it off your back by renewing your mind, Paul says, and understanding who we are in Christ. And that is how we begin to grow, to fight the flesh, to renew the mind. When Satan wants to tell me, you're no good, how in the world can you be a pastor? Oh, look what you did. Oh, look what you just thought. I have to say to him, I have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ.
And he says that any time I don't meet the standard of his law, that I can come to him, confess my sin to him, embrace the act of worship and repentance, and I am with him forever. And he loves me. Satan, get the hell out of here. I'm a believer. Get that monkey off your back, people. I was down in Williso. Randy and I were just finished doing an exposition of Romans. It was, all, it was awesome. I mean, it's fun to teach Romans, but when you do it in a condensed three days version, it's incredible. In fact, when the guys were walking out of there, we asked the president of the college, how, how is this going? How are they, what are they thinking? And he simply said this, the guys are glowing. They just have never, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. It's incredible. Well, I'm in my bed. I'm sleeping there. I First night, I didn't set up the mosquito net because I didn't think they were mosquitoes. And then I woke up in the morning and found out they love fresh, white, lumpy English skin. And they ate me on this side. And then when I rolled over, they ate this side. And I was eaten alive by mosquitoes. So I got in the net and I zipped it up. And I thought, ah, you're not going to get me now. Turned off the light, went to sleep. And I heard this scratching sound in my room. Now, I didn't eat dinner that night. I just had a few pistachios, and so I thought, oh no, I left those pistachios out, and some mouse got in here, and he's going through those pistachios. So I got my flashlight out, and I'm looking around. It's dark. I can't see anything, and all of a sudden, I go over to the door, and there's a gap of about an inch and a half under the door, and I see this hand (laughs) under the door. That's not a human hand. It's a monkey. (laughs) And so I start to giggle a little bit. I walk over there. I take a pistachio. I put it in his hand. (laughs) I'm listening. I can hear him crack open the pistachio. I can hear him eat the pistachio nut. And no sooner than he had finished eating the pistachio nut, that hand is back under there again. (laughs) So I give him another pistachio. And another pistachio. And I thought, this is going to go on until he's eaten all my pistachios. So this can't happen. So I got a towel and I, I rolled it up and I shoved it up against the door. No more monkeys. I went back to bed, slept wonderfully. Got up the next morning, took out the towel, opened the door. There were six monkeys standing there. <laughs> They all had their hands out. (laughs) Don't feed the monkeys. You ever heard the story, if you give a mouse a cookie? That's what it was like. In fact, the rest of the day, wherever I'd go, these monkeys would follow me around. Feed me, feed me, feed me. I should have learned, don't feed the monkeys. But here's what happens to us in our Christianity. We keep feeding the monkeys with all of the bad guilt and memories of our past and our failures of our present and we keep condemning ourselves and as long as you keep judging yourself and putting all that junk in your mind, you're going to be stuck and enslaved. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. He wants you to be enslaved to sin. He's not interested in liberating you at all. But you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you know, we try in our spiritual life by thinking that somehow, even though I've been born of the Spirit, now that if I just reduffle my efforts in the flesh, I'm somehow, I'm somehow going to be better. And the truth is, is you got to get the monkey off your back. You can't feed the monkey. You have to feed yourself God's Word on a daily basis. You have to be in his word. You have to immerse yourself in good fellowship in a small group where other people are experiencing God's grace. You have to break the bondage of the flesh by the power of the spirit because before you came to Christ, you were enslaved to sin. And somebody once said very well, you can take the person out of slavery, but you can't take the slavery out of the person. On the way back, I got a chance to watch a movie. It was, the movie was called Harriet. It's the true story of 
Harriet Tubman. I don't know if you know who she was, but an incredible woman. Uh, Last month was Black History Month, and I always try to read some theology written by some good black scholars just to kind of celebrate what God has done for them. But if you don't know her story, she was raised in the Deep South. She was a slave. And she was able to escape and move to the North. And there she lived in the North where she experienced freedom. And she met other people who had also escaped the South and moved to the North. But she was burdened because her kinsmen, her family still lived in slavery. Her mother and father were still in the deep south and enslaved. And so she decided that she was going to go back and she was going to rescue them. And this incredible woman made some 13 trips across the border down into the deep south and rescued over 70 people who were caught in slavery and gave them liberty. But here's the one thing that I noticed. That when they came from the south and they moved to the north and they had their freedom, no longer were they in bondage. The problem is, is for somebody who's been in slavery for a long time, you still think like a slave. And so if a white person would yell at you, you would instantly obey what they're saying. Why? Because you've been conditioned and you've been trained that way. The children of Israel had been enslaved for 430 years. No wonder when they have to go through the wilderness, they go through the wilderness in order for God to work the slavery out of them. And part of our journey in this life is recognizing the fullness of our redemption And what Christ has done for us. How he has liberated us. And how he has freed us. Because your old covenant master Satan himself wants to come back. He wants to grab you. He wants to say you serve me or die. And we need to live in the power of the resurrection and the new life in Christ. We need to understand that we have been liberated. That we have been freed. In fact, the Word of God tells us, and you study systematic theology, you'll know this, that we have not only been justified, but we have been sanctified, and we will ultimately be glorified. God has delivered us from the penalty of sin. God has delivered us from the power of sin in this life. And God is going to ultimately deliver us from the presence of sin. And we as his people are called every single day to live in that power. We're called to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. We're called to get the monkey off our back and stop feeding the monkey. And feed ourselves God's word and meditate on his salvation and what he has done for us. Because Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to remind you that you're a sinner. He wants to remind you that you're not perfect. He wants to remind you many times that you failed the law of God. But I say to you this. Jesus paid it all. He paid for my sins not just in the past. But he paid for my sins today. And he paid for my sins tomorrow. And he's paid for my sins in the future. And I don't take that as a liberty and say that we continue in sin. So that grace may abound. Paul says may it never be God forbid. But what it does mean for me is I celebrate my salvation and I thank God every single day that He saved me. And even though the enemy is going to try to come and retake my mind, I surrender my mind to the Word of God and I refuse to believe what what God says about me and believe... I said that wrong. I refuse to believe what Satan says about me and believe what God says about me. That's my identity in Christ. And you have no business, evil one, trying to destroy me. If he can take the children of Israel through that river by faith, cross that sea into the land, and then ultimately the promised land, he can do that for you because I've been saved by his powerful grace. Amen? Amen. That's point one. We're going to have to continue. (laughs) But what I was thinking was this. 
I was reading D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, incredible man of God. His, um, his exposition of Romans, I, I sat down to read it. It's six volumes. It's just on the book of Romans. And, and one of the things that he asks people is this. He asks people, this is the question he asks him. Are you a Christian? But here's how he says it. He says, are you a Christian today? Now, he doesn't mean, are you a Christian today in the sense of, well, I was a Christian today and I'm going to blow it tomorrow. But he asks that question because he realizes that people do something. People respond like this. When they ask him, are you a Christian today? They would say, well, I'm trying. I'm, 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 I'm really working on it. I'm, I'm, I, I believe and I'm, I'm reading my Bible and I, you know, I'm really, it's the same thing when, when we ask somebody, are you a man of God? It's funny to watch how people respond. I was watching Gus walk up to one pastor and he said, hello, man of God, how are you? And the guy was just flabbergasted. He was dumbfounded. He didn't know what to do. He just, well, 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 I'm trying to be a man of God. Well, wait a minute. If this book says you're a man of God, then you're a man of God. Amen. It doesn't say perfect, but it says you're a man of God. It says you've been bought, you've been redeemed, you belong to him. Because the only way that you become a Christian is by faith, not by your works. It is by faith and faith alone. That's why it says in Hebrews, they crossed through the sea by faith. I shocked the Ethiopian class that I was teaching on Romans, and I said to them, brothers, I want to tell you this great news, you are saved by works. And they just looked at me. I said, let me repeat it because I know you didn't hear me. You are saved by works. Amen. No. Yes, you are. No, they said. You are saved by works. No. I said, yes, you are. It's just not your works. It's the work of Jesus. <laughs> you see what I mean, people? Stop thinking you can redeem yourself because you can't. The only one that can redeem you is Christ Jesus our Lord. And if he loves you, and he does, and he saved you, and he did, get the monkey off your back and start living the life that he's called you to live in the power and the glory of his name. Amen. And we're going to do one of the things that we do this morning. We're going to remind ourselves of what he did. We're going to remind ourselves by taking communion. This is a visible, physical, tangible reminder of his body, of his blood that was shed, so that we remember and our mind is renewed through the physical act of remembering what Jesus has done for us. So let us prepare to receive the communion today. Father in heaven, I thank you. We bless your name for what you have done for us. I thank you for the power of Christ, his wonderful redemption. He loved us more than we can imagine. 